I'll introduce myself while, while we're waiting. If you don't know me already, my name is Lynn Morgan. I am the sales and marketing manager at Sustainable Northwest Wood and really excited to have you guys be with us here today. I know you, there's a lot of places you could be and I appreciate you taking time to be with us and to honor some women in sustainable building and to just learn a little bit more about their stories and what they're doing in the world. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Terry Campbell. He's our marketing and sales director. And I want to take just a moment to thank him for being one of the founding members of Sustainable Building Week, which is what this has been um, a, a huge part of what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks to connect people in the building and design industry. And I just want to say thank you to him personally for, for all the tireless uh, effort that he's put into helping make this event happen. And uh, with that, Terry, if you want to give us a little bit of uh, information about Sustainable Building Week for those who might not be familiar um, and, and for those who are, you know, have been here all along for this last couple of weeks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I'm going mask free for a second. There's no one within six feet. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, Terry Campbell here. Um, so we, we've, we're kind of almost near the uh, the end of a great two weeks of events. There's still some really good things coming up uh, later today and tomorrow. The schedule, you can kind of see it on the right. Um, feel, yeah, feel free to register for those events. I think the only one that is uh, the, um, the equity, diversity, and inclusion event is a workshop tomorrow. So that one does have a fee related to it, but the other two are, are free and open to to anyone who's uh, interested in learning more about those. Um, if you wanna sign up for the Sustainable Building Week newsletter, then uh, the website's in the bottom right corner. Um, promise we don't, we don't sell any of your personal information and we uh, sort of just reach out six to eight times a year to kind of let you know what we're up to and then sort of as uh, the October timeframe rolls around, we uh, kind of ramp up the communication. So feel free to stay in touch there. Um, next slide, please, Lynn. So we really couldn't hold uh, two weeks or one week of uh, events without a really top level uh, group of sponsors. Uh, as you can see from the logos here, it really kind of, um, it, it represents a very diverse group of businesses in this, uh, in this building industry. Um, and that's sort of the spirit of Sustainable Building Week. The, the main goal is just to break down silos amongst professionals and to do a lot more cross po uh, pollination and, and education and relationship building because to address the, the large challenges that face our our species we really need to kind of kind of stop the silo thinking and, and think more um, more integrated with each other and so that goes all the way from the developer through the design construction and material delivery manufacturing all the way back to the resource so um, that's our goal. It's a pretty big one, but um, as you can see, we're, we're definitely attracting the right companies who are feeling that. And I feel like over the two weeks, um, we've been seeing representation at these events from uh, from a, from a wide variety of backgrounds. Last slide, please, Lynn. And so the, um, the other side of uh, organizing these events is a, a group of collaborating organizations. Most of them are professional organizations that you're pretty familiar with in town. Some are institutions like Oregon State or U, uh, U of O. Um, others are, are sort of nonprofits who, um, who work in the sustainable um, building design uh, industry. And so these folks have also been very responsible for <clears throat> taking up the, the charge to host an event and to promote the, the, the series of events to their stakeholders. Um, so uh, yeah, so the nice thing about <laughs> one of the silver linings about COVID is that um, all, I think almost all of the events over the two weeks uh, are being recorded or have been recorded and they're gonna be reposited on the Sustainable Building Week website for free going forward. So if you saw something on that calendar a couple slides back, and you really wanted to, um, to to participate, but you couldn't. Feel free to look at that website in about a week or two, and um, and you'll see a lot of those events. You can go back and sort of fast forward or rewind. I know I I sat in on a couple that uh, the science was way above my pay grade. <laughs> I need to go back and kind of like listen to a couple of those multiple times to get the concept. So um, 
I'm really excited about this uh, event today and really, really proud of Lynn for pulling it all together. So I'm going to step away and, and let her take over again. Thanks, Terry. Um, so for those of you joining us, welcome. Really glad to have you here today. Um, we're, we're coming at you live from Portland, Oregon at Sustainable Northwest Wood. And uh, we're a local wood shop that uh, really focused on local wood products, uh, responsibly harvested. And we really believe that um, we can use local wood products to protect and improve our ecosystems and provide economic development in rural communities and really connect people to place. That's a, a big part of what we do. And um, today I'm honored to introduce three women who are um, doing good work in the world and focused on sustainable building and inspiring other women in the, the construction trade specifically. Um, it's kind of a, a neat thread that came through to connect um, two of these women on the panel with an organization that really helps to inspire and train women um, in positions in the trades. And there's some interesting things that I did as I was researching um, just how, what our footprint in the industry is. And it's pretty incredible that women make up just less than 10% of the overall workforce in the construction industry. And only 3.4% of those jobs are actually in the trades in construction and painting and plumbing and electrician work. And um, it, it's an area where women's salaries are very much on par with our male counterparts. And we don't really see that so much in the, the rest of the world or in the rest of the country anyway, where uh, most women's salaries are about 81% of our male counterparts, um, but we've really come a long way um, and want to give a shout out to Ruth Bader Ginsburg for her work in equality, especially when it comes to gender pay. And I, you know, we have come a long way, baby, and we still, we, I think we still have a ways to go. But uh, I think um, it's especially uh, true for me. I grew up under the feet of a carpenter and have been in the construction industry pretty much my whole career from um, working for a large paint manufacturer to being a painting contractor for 10 years and um, I have always been surrounded by a bunch of dudes uh, which I currently am and uh, but I'm very comfortable in that role and I, I love um, you know having a little bit different perspective and being able to add my personal experience and influence in this industry and I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be among some of the best and brightest um, within construction industry, within the sustainable building realm. And when we decided to host this event for Sustainable Building Week, we really wanted to bring some inspiring women to the forefront. And, um, and I personally wanted to hear their stories, their personal journey, their passion, um, and their determination. And I wanted to know, you know, why do you do what you do and how did you get here? And so uh, one of my inspirations was Esther Forbin, who is on our panel. She and I met at the Audubon Society when she was buying lumber for some really cool projects out there. And um, Esther formed her own sustainable building company in just January of this year. And uh, she's a lifelong conservationist and builder, and she dovetails uh, restoration forestry with traditional and contemporary sustainable building practices. She's the founding board member of the Klamath Lake Land Trust and has helped conserve over a thousand acres of valuable wildlife habitat in Southern Oregon. And she has worked for the Center of Biological Diversity, BARC, and Portland Audubon. Esther is a Mellon Environmental Studies Fellow with a Bachelor of Degree in Environmental Studies and History from Reed College. And she's an avid birder, a cyclist, and a dad joke enthusiast and an artist. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Esther Forbin with Esther Forbin LLC. Lynn, thank you so much for that enthusiastic introduction. So yeah, like Lynn said, I started my own general contracting firm um, in January. And so I'm a general contractor and also uh, a carpenter. Next slide, Lynn. 
I had the great fortune of working at Portland Audubon to build new enclosures for their um, education birds, their bird ambassadors. And um, so I built an enclosure uh, with the help of R&H for Aristophanes, the common raven, um, for Julio, the great horned owl, um, with the help of GGC construction, and Ruby, the turkey vulture, and Xena, the American kestrel. And Xena is um, an American kestrel, which is, I think, the smallest falcon in North America, and she's really special and amazing. I also um, happen to help uh, install a larger enclosure for Bybee, the western painted turtle, too. Next slide, Lynn. So this is um, Sam and I, and we're working on the inside of Julio's um, new enclosure. And these enclosures were built exclusively from the FSC certified Western Red Cedar from um, Sustainable Northwest uh, Wood. And so it was really great to work with uh, Lynn and Jake and Terry to source this really uh, spectacular building material for these projects. Um, so Sam is an animal trainer and uh, I was just helping her um, kit out Julio's new enclosure, and she's also the podcast of Always Be Burden, which is a really cool podcast about birding, so uh, check it out. Next slide. So this is, a, uh, this is a picture of Ruby's Mew, and this is on public display. So all the education birds are at the Wildlife Sanctuary, which is up on Cornell Road, adjacent to Forest Park. And so these are on public view, and um, this is actually a really large enclosure. Ruby is a turkey vulture, which is a pretty big bird. And so she needed a lot of room to sort of flap around in. Um, and you can see that it's, that it's built from the, the Western Red Cedar. And then the foundation is built out of um, the Restoration Juniper. And so um, I was really excited to use the Juniper on this project. It's in a conservation overlay. You know, as I hope people are somewhat familiar with Audubon, um, but they, they run a, a wildlife hospital um, and rest and um, a wildlife hospital and also um, a, a wildlife conservation area and so uh, it was really important to use materials that reflected the value of the organization and there was um, there's a conservation overlay so we weren't able to add any impermea impermeable surfaces so all of these enclosures are built to let rainwater flow um, right through. Uh, next slide. So this is just another view of um, Julio's enclosure and behind that is Aristophanes enclosure. And um, yeah, so Ari is a, a raven who's lived at Portland Audubon for many years and folks come back and visit him who've been visiting him since they were like a kid. So it was really, uh, it was a great joy to build these um, new um, enclosures that the public is interacting with every day. Next slide. So this is Sam working with Julio. Um, and so Sam is training Julio and it was really great to be able to offer these upgraded enclosures where um, not only are volunteers, some volunteers have been um, coming to Audubon and giving their time for like 20 years or something. So not only were we making bigger, um, safer enclosures for the animals that live there, um, but we were also able to, um, construct in such a way that really um, honors the commitment and the work that the volunteers have put in into um, taking care of these animals and honors the the time and commitment that staff put into caring for these animals and so for me it was it was such a privilege and a joy to be able to use this fsc um, western red cedar that's local and sustainable um, and really uh, i think honors their work and reflects back the, the values of that organization. Next slide, please. And I was also really lucky to work with OTI. Um, they brought classes uh, for their pre-apprenticeship uh, program up to the sanctuary. And we did some renovation on this beautiful shop that was built by volunteers many years ago. And so for me, um, just, I didn't actually go through OTI, but I got the opportunity to teach with them a few years ago and it was just, really amazing to to just work with these smart women and watch them learn how to use tools and um, just help empower them uh, so that was just a, a great joy and also to to be able to to 
to show um, women who are entering into the trades that yes, you can be a union carpenter. Yes, you could you know become a professional plumber. Um, but also, there's other kind of non-traditional careers in the trades, like you know um, building for wildlife, which is what we we got to do. Next slide. And so this crew and I um, renovated the lobby of the Wildlife Care Center at Portland Audubon. And so uh, we got to uh, learn a little bit about some framing and some demo. And we actually used the um, FSC finished plywood to build the countertop that every single person who brings in um, injured wildlife to get cared for at the animal hospital is going to be, you know, sitting at and filling out paperwork. So, um, yeah, that, that partnership with Sustainable Northwest has been really meaningful and important and helpful. And also, yeah, just working with OTI was just a huge joy and a great privilege. And um, yeah, I feel really lucky that we got to do that. Next slide. And then so the most recent project that I worked on um, at Audubon was the Temple of the Flying Squirrel. And I built that this summer um, using, again, the FSC Western Red Cedar, which is just a wonderful product to work with. It's like both like just really, um, it's just a really great product as far as just a carpenter. It's like light, it's pretty easy to cut, and it's basically just aromatherapy as you're building too. It just smells amazing. Um, so this small um, family of, of um, flying squirrels had come into the animal hospital while I was working on this project and they were these just adorable little tiny baby squirrels that needed to be fed um, pretty often and the whole sort of community around um, the wildlife care center was just a buzz with like how um, amazing these little creatures were and really hoping for the best outcome for them. And as they grew and got healthier, it kind of became clear that they were going to be the first patients that were going to be able to come outside and be rehabilitated in this new enclosure. And so we sort of jokingly started calling it the Temple of the Flying Squirrel. Um, and the name just stuck. And so now the, the folks at the animal hospital still call it the Temple of the Flying Squirrel. And they're going to use this space to um, rehabilitate wild mammals. Um, I know the summer before last, there were actually 22 baby skunks that were rehabbed um, up at the wildlife sanctuary. So, you know, it was just a real joy to work with this material in this special place that's a con that is a conservation project. And, um, you know, providing infrastructure for Portland Audubon that's helping them do their job of um, helping wild animals get healthy and well and be released back into the wild was, was really, really fun. So I appreciate that a lot. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to touch on really quickly a little bit of the conservation and restoration work that I've been lucky enough to participate in with the Klamath Lake Land Trust. Uh, my amazing sister Crystal and I uh, were founding board members and she's currently the executive director of Klamath Lake Land Trust. Um, and so in the past decade or so we've been able to um, conserve and restore over a thousand acres of, of wild areas in Eastern Oregon. And this is actually where the restoration juniper that I used on the projects up at Audubon comes from. It comes from Eastern Oregon. And there's these really special ecosystems um, like the high desert grasslands and the open sage scrub that have been encroached upon by juniper through, um, you know, generations of, of fire suppression. So it's sort of different land use regime that has been installed that has sort of made these really special um, landscapes imperiled. And so uh, every time you use this restoration juniper, um, you're helping to create more healthy ecosystems for, you know, amazing birds like sage grouse. And also I just wanted to sh show a quick uh, picture of the um, sauna that we built out of juniper in on the east side. So this is out near uh, Klamath Falls. And I say, you know, when you're on the west side, definitely build your sauna out of, of cedar. But if you're on the east side, think about juniper because it's actually a really amazing material to uh, build saunas out of. Next slide. And then another project I was uh, lucky enough to work on is uh, my own wood shop. So I built a wood shop uh, behind my house uh, with a crew of really awesome women. My dad and I sort of like designed it and dreamed about it and schemed about it for a couple of years and finally scraped, scraped together enough funds to erect this really awesome wood shop. Next slide. 
And that was Carrie of GGC and she's a local contractor and just a total boss framer. So I definitely could not have done it without her. And uh, this crew of really amazing women, um, we built it really from, from the ground up. And although it's, um, uh, it is a, a sort of humble structure, I anticipate really um, ambitious projects coming out of it. Next slide. And so really my goal is to just build a, uh, you know, a community of awesome, sustainable um, builders. Um, I really love collaborating with women and other folks who are committed to conservation and restoration. And um, yeah, so there it is kind of from, uh, from plans to, to finish product there. And uh, yeah, so thanks so much for letting me talk to you for a few minutes about what I'm up to. Thank you, Esther, uh, that you were just so inspiring and I just really appreciate the work that you do. And yeah, I'm, I'm right with you. I love working with women and love getting involved in projects um, that women are part of. Um, it's really meaningful work and I appreciate what you do. Thanks. Um, I wanted to take a moment, if we could, in between to, um, to kind of poll the room. I'd like to see who's here and if Terry, if you can launch a poll for us and um, we want to just know what profession you're in um, as you join the room today give you a chance to uh, to weigh in on what you do for a living and see if that'll launch up is it is it up okay cool it's a little bit hard for me to know back here <laughs> give you just a moment to uh, to weigh in on that and and while you do that I want to uh, welcome Chelsea um, I, I want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> to the room. Um, Chelsea's part of a, a super cool company that we get to work with on a real regular basis, Green Hammer Design Build. It's a local Portland firm. And um, Chelsea has made a journey um, with, with Green Hammer uh, from carpenter to project engineer. And she is an Oregon tradeswomen uh, graduate and began her career as a carpenter in January of 2019 before moving into project management. And she is passionate about our earth and environment and found great value and pride in, in a career working within the green industry and sustainability. Her love for hard work, genuine people, and building community led her to this path. Her skills learned through Oregon tradeswomen empowered her to enter into a male-dominated field and she's a strong ally for all women in the trades. With a BFA in theater arts and a minor in environmental studies, Chelsea is a lover of art, nature, dance, and spending time with family, friends, and community. And I recently learned that she plays the ukulele too, which is really fun. <laughs> so without further ado, I will introduce Chelsea and let you take it over. Thank you, Lynn. So my name is Chelsea. I'm a project engineer at Greenhammer. I know this panel is focusing on women in sustainability as it relates to the construction industry, and I will be sharing with you a little bit of the work I'm proud to have accomplished, but I did just want to spend a little bit of time about my background and share how I got where I am today, and hopefully through this presentation I could inspire more women to enter the trades. So next slide. So I grew up camping at many national parks and my family spent a lot of time in nature. Some of my greatest childhood memories revolve around being in a forest or seeing a beautiful mountain and playing in creeks and rivers. So a reverence for the surrounding ecosystems and beauty of our natural places was instilled in me at a very young age. Uh, by the time I got to college, I decided that I wanted to minor in environmental studies and I remember taking my first sustainability course and I can honestly say that that class changed my life. I felt like I was finally learning what I could do to make a difference in the world and so that heavily influenced my career choices after college and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to enjoy my work. I wanted my work to make a difference and be of importance. Um, I wanted to find something where there was growth and an opportunity to make good money and a bonus if that could eventually turn into something that I could run my own business with. And I also wanted something that I could take with me anywhere I went. And so I knew that I needed a skill set. And I had heard about Oregon Tradeswoman from a friend. So in spring of 2018, I decided to move to Portland and I applied for the program. 
And this is where my entry into construction really begins. Um, I have immense amount of gratitude for Oregon Tradeswomen. Um, it's a pre-apprenticeship program that gives women the skills to join the construction industry. I had no previous experience in construction industry. My college major is in theater arts, so, and I have no immediate family that's in the trade, so I really knew nothing. Um, and after I completed the program, uh, OTI had an optional class called Intro to Green Construction, and I knew I was really interested in the intersection between construction and sustainability, and I knew that I wanted to do residential carpentry and work with wood. So from taking that class, I was introduced to the Sustainable Homes Professional course, um, in which SHP is a six-month course that Earth Advantage puts on every year. And the course focuses on building science. So how we build energy efficient buildings, what materials we use, like what design methods to incorporate. So I applied for a scholarship for the program. I got it and took the course and became certified. And I learned so much through this course. I felt like I was really finally understanding the relationship between sustainability and construction and that I was really finding my niche in there as a career, which felt really great. And through taking that course, I realized I wanted to work for Greenhammer. So I applied and I got hired as a carpenter in January of 2019. I did carpentry there for about a year and a half. And then just two months ago, I got promoted to project engineer. Next slide. So women only make up about 3% of the construction industry nationwide as far as being in the actual trades go. It's closer to 8% here in Oregon. But uh, OTI not only gave me the skills to join the trades, they also taught me a lot about what it would be being a woman entering a male-dominated field and the challenges that I may encounter being a woman in a male-dominated field that mostly focuses on physical labor. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about that um, later. But on the flip side of this, by choosing a career in a male-dominated industry, I was participating in social justice. Not only was I choosing a career with upward mobility and decent pay, but I felt like my work had meaning and it was really empowering. And the more I learned about green construction, the more I realized that the ideals that bring someone to care about sustainability and construction also have large parallels to forward thinking mentality on the job side as far as welcoming women and minorities. Next slide. So I wanted to work for a company that focuses on sustainable methods and products. And not only do we not want our homes full of these unhealthy toxic materials, but I didn't want to be around those materials and using them as a carpenter. So Greenhammer really focuses on sustainability and building science to create these health, healthy and inspiring buildings. And one large design component that we use in almost all of our buildings is building a real airtight building. The more airtight your building is, the more energy efficient it is. And when you pair that with a well-matched ventilation system, you're getting not only the energy efficiency, but you're also getting the cleanest fresh air throughout your home. And then also moisture management is really important. So we want these airtight buildings to be able to handle moisture really well. And then also thinking about adding design elements that focus on stormwater management on the site as well, like rainwater catchment or using drywalls and things like that. As far as during construction goes, uh, waste management and recycling on jobs is extremely important. Construction is one of the largest contributors to landfill waste as well as just energy usage nationwide. So anything we can do to mitigate our waste footprint is extremely important. And we like to salvage and reuse whatever we can on jobs and what we can't, we always like to use FSC lumber that we get from Sustainable Northwest. Um, and we're also always trying out new products like low carbon concrete or using lower embodied carbon options like some of the foams that we use for sub slab and exterior insulation. And then all of the finishes and finished products that we use are low VOC. So not only are our buildings healthy, but I felt healthier as a builder using these products versus what we would use in normal construction. Um, here's just a picture of browser whole home remodel that I worked on a lot of over the past year. Next slide. Great, thanks. So I just wanted to share some, Go, can you go back one more? Great, thanks. I just wanted to share some of the photos of projects I've worked on. So this is Spoon Javon remodel. 
Um, it was a whole house remodel that we did in North Portland. It was Earth Advantage Platinum Certified. It was the first job for me working at Greenhammer where I started in framing and got to see it all the way through to finish. So the middle picture shows the front street view of the house. The top left is just a time lapse of me building the front porch railings. Um, the bottom left right underneath that shows their back deck and I installed and sanded all the deck boards on this project, which was a great learning experience for me. All the way to the right shows the same deck finished as well as all the pavers we put in. So I did a lot of work on the pavers and underneath the pavers we put in a dry well. So to the left you can see me digging out the big hole for the dry well. And then the bottom middle picture is just a shot of the interior. Next slide. So here are some other miscellaneous projects that I've worked on a lot that I'm pretty proud of. The two top photos are of New Day Preschool, which was the first zero energy uh, solar powered preschool in the country. We deconstructed a pre-existing uh, structure, which you can see on the top right. And I did a lot of decon work there, which was an awesome learning experience. Um, and then the two photos on the left are again of Browser, which was Earth Advantage Platinum Certified. I worked on this project more than any other and probably learned the most as a carpenter from this project. So the two photos there shows me standing on some framing. It's the first window I ever framed by myself. Um, we demoed all the existing windows and then replaced them with triple pane Zola windows that are really energy efficient. So that was really fun. Um, the middle photo is just a fun project I really enjoyed. We went to Opal Creek and built them an outdoor um, education building. And that was just a really fun place to go out and building in like some beautiful area. And then the bottom right is a time lapse of me removing a floor. That was our best historical home renovation we did in Lads Edition. And we remodeled about a little over half the house. And in the remodel, we installed blown in cell cellulose insulation, we upgraded the windows, and we had to um, match pre existing designs since it was a historical home. So I learned a lot about doing lumber takeoffs and some finished carpentry tricks for matching a pre existing look of a home. So that was a fun project. Next slide. So thanks so much for your time. I'm happy to answer anyone's questions if they have anything to say. I just wanted to end by saying that I can honestly say that beginning a career in green construction has been one of the best decisions I've ever made. Not only is my work extremely rewarding, but I really feel like I'm making a difference in the world. I'm challenging the status quo of what a woman can do for a career, as well as challenging the status quo for what we value and how we build our buildings. So I'm constantly growing, learning, and becoming more empowered, and it just feels really great. Yeah, thank you. That's so great, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's super cool to see the projects that you are a part of, and uh, the New Day School is just down the street from, from our shop, and get to go by that little building um, pretty much every day. So um, thank you so much for that. Thank you. I want to take a moment to uh, introduce Brenda Gaynor. Um, she, she's like the, the thread between this group of women. Um, I actually um, played some music for some social gatherings at Oregon Tr Trades Women a number of years ago. And I'm a huge fan of this organization. And uh, Brenda is a training manager at Oregon Trades Women. It's a super cool um, educational uh, facility here in Portland. And she uses her background as a marine carpenter to encourage and inspire other women to improve their training, uh, to, to improve their own career path in the skilled trades. And she leads her team constantly to improve their training program so that more women can have access and opportunities. She understands that in addition to having the physical skills necessary for our industry, it's critical for women to have self-confidence, problem solving, coordination and communication skills in order to be successful. And she shares her own experience openly to encourage other women to pursue the trades as a fulfilling career choice. And with that, I'll let Brenda take it away. Thank you, Lynn, for that introduction. Um, uh, I, just, I just want to say hi to Esther as well as Chelsea. And Chelsea, thanks because you, <laughs> uh, you spoke quite a bit about OTW and I, and I appreciate that because um, you, you outlined everything that we try to teach in our organization um, to, to get women out at, you know, in the field and to be confident and 
make sure that they have the tools necessary to be to be successful. And um, it's really important to me, just as an individual, to see more um, women and minorities out in the field uh, to represent because so many, so many <laughs> years we have just been pushed down and told, sorry, we can't, you guys can't do it. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability to do math. You don't have the ability to, to communicate or you just don't have the strength um, emotionally to be able to carry yourself in a field dominated by men. And that's not true. That is definitely not true. And so um, we, we try to make sure to prepare our folks so that when they're out there, you know, they've got the support from us. I always tell my students that this is home base. And if you ever need the support, um, and if anything happens out in the field, please come back to home base and let's see what we can do. Because I don't want you to feel alone. And um, so I'm really glad to be a part of this organization. Um, my background is, uh, like Lynn mentioned, I am a marine carpenter. I worked out in that trade for a very long time. And for, for folks that don't know what marine carpentry really is, it's boat building, it's a shipwright, it's a boat repair, and you're working with either, either fiberglass or um, wood. Uh, there's folks that go into aluminum, steel, um, shipbuilding and whatnot. Um, I had the opportunity uh, out in Seattle to work for a boat building a um, uh, company called Jensen Motorboat. Unfortunately, uh, it closed down um, after almost 100 years of being in service. It just closed down last year, and that was a real heartbreaker um, because so many products came out of that uh, out of that shop. However, a lot of pollution did as well. <laughs> so, boat building is not a sustainable trade. I will tell you that for sure. And um, but there are folks out there that are trying to implement um, sustainable. Um, practice um, when they're repairing boats. But when I worked in the in the boatyard, I mean, we were using teak, we were using mahogany, we were using all, you know, sorts of wood that um, lumber that, you know, came straight from the rainforest. And it was really heartbreaking to me because I consider myself an environmentalist. I consider myself, you know, a big proponent of green building and, and, and sustainability. However, this broke all my beliefs <laughs> and my, and my, um, you know, personal, just personal choices and beliefs. And, um, and it was very hard to work in that industry, even though I love boats, I've been immersed with boats all my life. And um, so it really, uh, it was very hard for me. I mean, I worked with toxic chemicals uh, that we tried to um, contain as much as possible. But when you're grinding uh, fiberglass and wood, I mean, those particulates get out in the atmosphere. And um, there's only so much you can do. And you're also destroying your brain cells in the meantime, working with all those chemicals and whatnot. So I had to get out of it. And, um, and um, it was a very hard choice, but I had to. And um, I, I come from the Philippines as well. And uh, for the first 12 years of my life, I grew up um, in abject po poverty. Uh, I still have family out there. Um, we grew up around sewage and a lot of... Um, uh, pollutants in the water. Um, I grew up around my cousins and I wouldn't do it myself, but they would jump into pools of water that had um, sewage and, um, and plastics as well as other garbage and debris. I grew up around big mounds of, um, um, of trash. Um, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's um, unfortunately that, that, uh, that is growing, um, that pollution is growing and it's become out of control where it's, uh, it's going to take a long time to actually clean up. So that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And unfortunately, my family uh, still lives um, around that, um, around that, uh, that pollution. So, um, but uh, enough about me. <laughs> I can want to talk about OTW. Um, so if you don't mind changing to the next slide, Lynn. So, uh, OTW, um, we, are, like I said earlier, and as Chelsea mentioned as well, and as well as Esther, uh, we try to put women to work and we try to get them um, exposed to so many trades. And uh, from this slide right here, I mean, we've, um, we try to, uh, you know, 
bring in trades workers as guest speakers and we try to have field trips and we try to um, bring speakers to our new shops so that we can have them uh, teach our students their trade as well. Um, so we, like we've got so many, so many trades right here and this list doesn't even represent all of it. We've even got subcategories of trades um, as well. So if you go into electricians, like what electric, you know, what kind of electrician do you want to be? There's a electrical, there's, you know, there's, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a uh, residential, um, there's commercial, there's uh, solar. I mean, it's mind blowing how many are out there. And if you want to be a, a carpenter, like what kind of carpenter do you want to be? There's so many carpenters out there. There's residential, there's pile drivers, and there's, you know, pile bucks, which I didn't even know about, but that's a thing. So, you know, so we try to teach all those aspects. And with our new um, shop layout, uh, and I think I tried to show Lynn, but I didn't, I don't know if you were able to see, um, we're able to um, uh, fulfill the, the, request from our students um, to bring in more trades. Um, in the past, we've been carpentry heavy, which is totally fine, because that's my trade, and I can talk about that all day long <laughs> and to the moon. Um, but uh, right now, we've actually got plumbers representing. They're, they're teaching our students how to um, install basic plumbing. Last week, we had electricians come in to um, uh, teach students how to uh, wire a light. And next week, we have roofers coming in to teach them how to anything, you know, all, all things roofing. So, um, but before that, uh, my colleague Carol and I, we actually showed students how to build um, a shed from blueprints. And so they were able to build a simple rough um, opening of both a window and a door. And... Um, Part of the reason why we are building sheds is so that we can actually uh, sell these items to the community as well. Um, uh, if you don't mind changing to the next. So one thing that we are trying to emphasize with students that even though you are um, excited about going into these trades, do not limit yourself. Do not limit yourself to just being um, a carpenter or an electrician or a steam fitter or whatnot. Think about how you can advance yourself. A lot of times, um, and this is true for myself as well, I didn't feel that I was qualified or that I didn't feel like I had the wherewithal to be able to be in a superintendent or foreman or, or whatnot. And I, I say actually four person instead, but <laughs> because it's, you know, it's time to be all inclusive, right? So, um, so anyway, it's really important that we emphasize to students, do not limit yourself within your industry. Make sure that you get the training so that you can become, you know, that you can go into the manager position because you have the smarts to do it. Um, you just need to advocate for yourself as much as possible. And this is really important messaging that we give to our students. Advocate, advocate, advocate. Advocate for your future. Advocate for your safety. Advocate um, to be able to do a project. Because sometimes, and this is what I've heard in the, in, um, uh, from students when they come back after working out in the field for a few months, and this is also uh, something that I've had to deal with myself. When I first got into my trade, as well as my students, they get relegated to the the dig uh, the ditch digging, sweep floor sweeping, you know things like that. And so you know you really got to advocate. Like I can do this work. You've got to believe in me. And sometimes uh, you know I hate to say this, but sometimes men are just really kind of reluctant. They don't know if you have the strength to do it. They just kind of are sizing you up a little bit. But you got to really advocate for yourself. So we're trying to teach that confidence building here at uh, at otw so we've you know there's so many there's so many different types of um there's so many different types of uh um ladder i mean i'm sorry you can you can uh climb that ladder to reach those uh different types of um, managerial positions you just got to really believe in yourself and we'll teach you that um so the way we keep training relevant, um, we at the at our organization, um, we have uh, industry advisory council. Um, we constantly update uh, the um, the curriculum so that we're uh, keeping our teaching relevant to, to our students and uh, keeping up with what our trades uh, partners at. Um, and their needs um, before we actually release our students to uh, to the field. So and to our respective partners, um, we try to make sure that we that um, our training includes uh, updates to trades resumes or any um, information that we need to give to our students about um, updates um, 
from our apprenticeships as well. So sometimes those change. Um, we also try to make sure that we update the information as, uh, as far as um, wages and benefits and things like that go. There's a lot of information that we give our students and we want to make sure that we keep that information updated. Um, guest instructors and hands-on. Um, we want to expose our students to as many of our, as our, uh, of our guests as possible um, because our trades guests have so much information to give that I myself or my colleague um, probably will miss. And so, and a lot of times it has to do with like, what is it, what, what is it like to be in a union? What is it like to be in a non-union? And we try to represent both um, as much as possible so that students know that they have a choice. They don't have to join one or the other. They're not gonna be forced by us to do so, but we'll give them the, the information. Um, and field trips, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've had to, we've had to <laughs> um, cut back on the, on the field trips. Um, however, our trades partners uh, are still open to having our students come in for off-site, uh, or I'm sorry, on-site field trips. And so on week six, we're at week four now, on week six, actually our students, um, they get to go to uh, a trades um, facility for a day, for a few hours, to do some hands-on training. So for example, iron workers has opened their doors, laborers, um, bricklayers, and uh, we have steam fitters, I'm sorry, sprinkler fitters coming into our facility. So they get exposure with that, as well as electrical and um, carpenter. They've opened up their um, doors so that they can have students for, come in for a day or two. Um, mock interviews, wow, that's really important. A lot of students, get they get, get very nervous when it comes to their interviewing. And when it comes to trades, we want to make sure that they are fully prepared to do so. So we set them up with um, a trades portfolio and we tell them this is what you need to put in your portfolio to be ready. Take pictures of the projects that you've worked on. Here's your training log. That way you can talk about the projects that you've worked on. That way you can talk about it confidently. And, um, and you know, wherever you decide to go to and what interview, you know, and whatever interview that, um, that you, um, get to participate in. Hopefully that'll land you a job, you know, and um, we want you to walk in with much confidence and we want you to, you know, to be able to talk about yourself and what you're able to do and what you have done. Um, and then, um, oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say direct entry and direct hire. We have um, negotiations and contracts with both IBEW, um, which is our electric, electrician's partners, and, um, and uh, PNCI, uh, which is our, our carpentry uh, union partners. And um, they, because of our status, um, they actually let our students in based on um, on this contract and so students do go through an evaluation process uh, with our partners and um, and then they are invited in so uh, that means that they do not have to go through uh, the um, normal procedures that folks uh, applying to their um, unions or or yeah, their unions have to go through so there are special considerations which we're very very grateful for uh, because we appreciate the the partnership that we have um, with our trades partners. They've been wonderful to work with and um, and I it's, the sky's the limit from here and I'm really excited about where this is going to go for our students especially. Um, and then employer employer meet and greets uh, that's because of COVID we've had to cut back on that but in the past we've uh, tried to um, uh, introduce students to potential employers but that you know that's also meeting folks uh, on Zoom now and we're doing a lot of guest speakers um, so that we can expose our students to uh, potential employers so all right next slide uh, so we do train approximately 120 adults annually. We've had to cut back on that this year because of COVID. Um, uh, most most um, pre-apprenticeships had to uh, close their doors for, for a while while we try to figure out what <laughs> this new training is going to entail. And so, um, so but typically we would... Uh, we would train more people throughout the year. But um, I do have 17 students right now, and I've had to split them up into two groups. Um, so group A comes into uh, on Wednesday, and group B comes in on Thursday to shop, and then we, treat, uh, we teach them hands-on training. And then the rest of the class we do on Zoom. So it's been, um, it's been a whirlwind. 
<laughs> it's been a ride, but we're working it out. And um, it's, uh, it, I think this is going to be the new norm for, for a little while. So we're adapting as we go, but I'm really glad to have the shop open and the students are super, super glad to be working because I mean, their eyes light up. Oh my gosh. When you see their eyes light up, it, it makes my job worthwhile. Sorry, I almost teared up there. <laughs> so try not to tear up. Um, we do have an 87% placement rate, so we are bringing students into work, um, you know, as soon as possible. And that's because of the exposure that we're giving um, uh, them to, to our trades partners. And, um, and then we do have a 93% retention rate. I think I had my last class back in um, winter 2020, um, which was March, I think when they graduated, I think about... 98% of them actually went into the workforce immediately. Um, and um, most of them are actually with uh, plumbers right now. <laughs> so uh, local 290 <laughs> scooped them all up, so <laughs> which I'm really proud of. So, um, and then employers indicating employee satisfaction, 100% would hire from Oregon tradeswomen. That's because we try to, um, we try to get them prepared and aware and we also um, try to make sure that uh, they have the tools that they need to be able to uh, interview and uh, get hired with um, with the tools that we give them um, average age of graduate uh, of a graduate is 34 years old i myself when i graduated from my trade i was about 32 years old and so i'm nearly 50 right now and i tell you it has been the best the best life I've held, you know, that I've had since I got into my trade. So it hurt my knees, but <laughs> it is what it is. And I, and I don't regret any of it. <laughs> I tell my students, like, get those knee pads as soon as you can. Um, industry credentials. Uh, we uh, make sure that all of our students have um, uh, the information that they need to be able to graduate. Um, we are uh, BOLI certified, and so with that certification, um, they, get a, get, they can get into any apprenticeship uh, as long as they have that accreditation. Um, next slide, please. Um, yes, 63% of women served um, are uh, SNAP or TANF recipients, and so uh, with that, um, with that status, they are able to get into our um, get into our or, uh, program, and so we try to do the best we can um, to to serve folks who have um, uh, who have barriers. And so, it's important um, that we serve the community as much as possible that have these barriers. And so, um, one of the reasons why we moved to close to Gresham is because the area that we were in initially, uh, which was uh, in the MLK area. Um, it's, it's being largely gentrified. And so um, we couldn't reach the amount of students um, that we were that we we're looking for and uh, so that we can provide jobs and, you know, training and jobs to get out there in, in the construction workforce. And so, um, so our biggest goal of moving here is to uh, reach out to the community in this area and so that we can start start training accordingly. And, um, and um, but yeah, 53% of women um, that we serve are BIPOC uh, uh, folks, and 15% formerly incarcerated. And this is a this is a big fear amongst folks who have been incarcerated. Their their fear is, are, can I get a job? And so, thank God, our our, um, our participants are very willing to take folks that, you know, you just people people really you know, when they come through our program, they really want to work hard and they, they're, they really try to prove that they are hard workers despite their past. And so we try to, we try to, you know, tell them that, you know, we will, we'll get you a job because this is not, this is not the stopping point for you. You know, there's so much potential out there for you and we're going to do the best we can to get you those jobs. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Um, Women earn less than their male, male counterparts. Oh, yeah, it, it is very true in general. Um, but in the construction industry, especially um, in, um, as a union worker, you get the same amount of pay as a woman than you, than, uh, um, um, and, and as well as men. So both uh, earn equal amounts because uh, within the union, they have contracts that say that um, all workers will earn the same amount. Um, 
48% of women head, headed households with children are, are food insecure. Um, uh, most, there's a couple of my students that have come through um, that uh, have a hard time choosing between um, whether or not to be themselves and or their children. And so uh, we try to provide um, the assistance as much as possible through OTW to make sure that the students that come through our program are fed and, um, and that they do not have to have, to have this, um, this weight and this stress within themselves. Um, so we try to do the best we can um, to help them because as they come through our program, um, I want them to feel uh, safe and um, supported. Um, let's see here, over 1 million of uh, Oregon uh, women and girls have been sexually assaulted or experienced domestic violence, um, one of the three highest rates in the nation. Um, we do have folks that do come through uh, through our organization that have experienced um, domestic violence. And so um, we try to make sure to protect their identity and make sure again, that they are safe um, and that um, we make them well aware of what the industry is like. It's not gonna be easy, especially for folks who have gone, who have had DV in their past or maybe you know, at the current situation. Um, so we try to make sure that they know that the industry is not a very easy place for folks to work at, especially if you've had that trauma in your life. So we try to make sure to offer that support if, if anything does happen. So um, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide. I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I don't wanna, make, I don't wanna <laughs> uh, uh, take up most of your time there. But uh, for folks that are interested in coming into our program, or if you just want to talk to me about the program itself, or if you want a tour of our facility especially, I am so open to having you come and, and take a look because um, I'm very proud of the work that we are doing. I'm very proud to be a part of this organization. I wish there was an organization um, that, that I would have known of up in, Seattle, up in Seattle, and I think there is actually an organization up there but being in my industry, I felt quite alone, uh, even though both my partner and I, we were both in the boat building industry. <laughs> and we were, um, all we did was work in a, a very male dominated industry. We're the only women in our boat yards. And, um, but I'm so happy that I can be a part of changing women's lives. And um, I can't tell you enough um, how much I wanna share this experience with others. So please uh, contact me and, um, and I'm really glad to be a part of this, uh, this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brenda. Really, really um, proud of the work that you guys do um, and would offer up if your students ever wanna to come to our shop for a shop tour, we can arrange that and you and I can talk about that a little bit later. You know it, they'll be we, so, we so excited. <laughs> the work that you're doing, yeah, for sure. And I would open that up to anybody who's here today. Um, let us know if you want to come visit our facility. I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention that um, we are doing a whole ongoing series of sustainable wood stories featuring, um, you know, uh, the, the origin of our wood products and customer projects, local suppliers, and these, you know, environmental and social issues that our, that our industry and our society is facing. And uh, we're doing these every couple of months. We have another one coming up in uh, December, and it's gonna be on the hot topic of wildfires. See what I did there? Um, and so I, I wanna see if Terry can uh, post a poll. If you want to be on our mailing list, uh, we send out a newsletter once a month, and we can let you know when we have cool events like this. Uh, coming up and um, just if you are already part of our newsletter, that's cool um, And it but if you want to join and, and just you know, let us send you a little note um, To let you know when we have cool events like this coming up. I definitely want to thank all of our speakers today um, And give everyone a chance and we're right at the one o'clock hour now But if you have questions if you want to type those in the chat uh, We can um, take some questions and would love to hear from you if you want to let us know what's on your mind And Terry's got the poll going. And I, yeah, I just want to say this was a really inspiring uh, group of women today. Appreciate each and every one of you so much.
And one question that I'd like to pose to the group um, is when did you first know that you wanted to build things? Like what moment in your life did something click that you knew that you wanted to be a maker and a builder? Chelsea, if you want to start us out on that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Since you're at the top of the list there. <laughs> um, I think I've always, just from being a young kid, I really liked building things with my hands, whether it was sewing or drawing, or I just really always enjoyed working with my hands. And um, after college, I did farming for a little bit and worked on some organic vegetable farms. And through that, had met some people who were doing um, like cob building. And it just, to me, being self-sufficient in everything I can do, so not only being able to grow my own food, but like build my own shelter just really felt right to me. And so I think, yeah, like right around the end of college and being a farmer, that was definitely what clicked for me of like, oh yeah, I can build a house. Like it just felt like something I wanted to learn how to do. That's awesome. Yeah, Esther, do you want to answer that question too? You're muted. <laughs> Got to unmute yourself, though. Can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really appreciate what Brenda was saying about Oregon Tradeswomen. And um, part of why I got into doing construction work was because um, I saw my guy friends being able to jump into a trade where they were making pretty decent wages um, and had some, a lot of flexibility um, without having a college degree. I actually got a degree later in life. Um, and uh, so, yeah, part of it was actually a, a, a financial decision coming from a working class uh, background. It was a, a more viable option for me to kind of just be able to jump in and, and uh, get a decent wage. That's great. And I, I love building, too. It's really yeah. fun. And you're really good at it, too. <laughs> hey, Brenda, I want to ask you a question. There's a question in the chat that's come up uh, from one of our retailers that's actually down in um, Tucson, Arizona. And she's asking if you know about other organizations, trade organizations um, in other states that do similar work to what Oregon Trades Women does, if there are other organizations that we might pull from around the country. So uh, the only organization that I know of is uh, West Virginia, um, West Virginia Women in Trades, I believe. Uh, they are doing, um, and mind you, this was as of May of this year that, uh, they are doing a, um, I apologize, I'm trying to think here. They're packaging their hands-on and um, they're sending it to, to students. Um, so students pick up their packages um, for hands-on training and, and then they take them home and they build these projects. And then I think they do Zoom training. Um, so we thought about doing that. However, there, there's a lot of limitations with that, especially, um, trying to figure out projects and uh, really getting um, folks to learn how to use their tools appropriately. And so that's why we had to go the route that we had to take um, to uh, create a COVID safe, well, COVID free, <laughs> as much as possible, um, COVID free environment um, here in our shop. And so, um, but is the, the thing that I'm thinking about in regards to taking um, projects uh, home is, uh, you know, using, uh, you know a saw or using a hammer and whatnot and what if you work in a in an apartment setting you know live in a in an apartment and whatnot and so it, it limits um that ability to to do um hand, true hands-on training sorry that's my dog <laughs> he sounds like an impact driver <laughs> so, um but yeah, that's the only organization that I know of so far that are, that are doing the hands-on training. Um I checked in with PYB and I think they're all doing only Zoom right now. Cool. Cool. Well, one more question that came up in the, in the chat was if you have any advice from, uh, from women trying to get into the industry, especially during COVID. Um, and I could say like apply because uh, the, the construction industry is booming right now. There should be lots of job opportunities. And I think the construction industry in general is recognizing that a diverse workplace is, is really important um, and can only help the industry as a whole. 
So if any of the rest of you have some feedback, but you know, about how to jump into the industry now, we'll let that be the last question. And I would encourage if we've missed a question that feels important in uh, email me at info at snwwood.com and we'll be sure to get your answers um, to you right away. And you will be able to see a recording of this uh, video on our YouTube channel. Um, you can Google uh, in the in the YouTube site. You can um, put in Sustainable Wood Stories, and you'll be able to find it there. Um, and if you came in late, you'll also be able to find a recording of our session today on the Sustainable Building Week website. But yeah, if you've got any last minute advice on how to get into the industry when you have a degree, she's a recent graduate of PCC Design Build Program. And so if there's some opportunities out there at Green Hammer or otherwise, you know, for some women to get involved, um, I'd love to hear that as a one, one final answer. I, yeah, I definitely think figure out what exactly you want to do and you can go on um, like Energy Trust has a contractor. Um, search by contractor or search by trade. So if you figure out exactly what you want to do, you can go on that website, search trade. It'll show you all of the companies that Energy Trust backs in the Portland area and go on their websites and like look and see, oh, I really like what they're about me is. And then really dial in your resume and then just shoot off as many resumes as possible. And then after a week goes by, start calling people. Um, I think that's really important. And, you know, like I do think that the trades are valuing women a lot more. So even if places say they're not hiring, if you're a woman applying or you're a minority applying, that can go a really long way because they want to hire those people anyways. So that would be my recommendation. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I was going to say too, um, and I want to echo what Chelsea just said. I mean, my trades partners are knocking at my door or calling me and saying, we need women. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. apply, apply, apply. And if you need help um, with your resume, you're more than welcome to contact me. We'll help you with that so that we can make a trade specific and, um, and, uh, and help you, you know, create a portfolio as well, you're more than welcome to reach out um, so that we can provide that resource. But do not hesitate to apply because, I mean, laborers, is look, they're looking for people. I mean, plumbers are looking for people. I mean, you name it. I mean, it's, it's booming. Yeah. 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 The industry's booming right now. Take advantage of it. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Thanks, Terry, for backing me up. Thank you, Sustainable Northwest Wood, for hosting and letting us do this good work in the world. And, and thanks a lot to Sustainable Building Week and all the volunteers and people that have helped to pull together almost 30 events uh, over the course of the last two weeks. And we're super proud to be part of it and look forward to seeing you in December when we host another one of these. So stay in touch and enjoy the day. Thank you, Lynn. Right. Take Thank care, you. everybody. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thank Super you fun. so much, speakers. You guys were amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>